Hi, it's Robin McMahon here. I'm the host of Parenting Our Future. And if you're listening to this podcast, I want to thank you so much for being here. I also want you to know that I'm a former angry mom. I used to yell and rage and threaten and punish my kids because I wasn't getting the cooperation or the behavior that I felt I should be getting. And I struggled for many years, not knowing how to change or knowing what to do differently. It wasn't until I found the world of peaceful parenting that I learned why my kids acted the way they did and also why I was so angry and triggered. I was able to heal my anger and leave my triggers behind so that I could focus on being the calm and confident parent I always expected myself to be. I can tell you that feeling connected to your kids is the best feeling in the world. My two boys are teenagers now, and we have a strong relationship that is rooted in deep connection. And where there is connection, there's cooperation. Parenting is the most important job we do, but it's the hardest job we do. And we do it without understanding the fundamentals of the way our kids grow and develop. And we do it without knowing the way their brains work or what their behavior is actually really telling us. So it's no wonder it's so hard. And it's okay to ask for help. It's okay to say, this is harder than I thought it would be. And that's where I come in. I can help you and I can support you so that you can have the cooperation and enjoy being a parent. You can book a free call with me on my website, parentingforconnection.com. And if you want to download my free guide, how to turn a no into cooperation, go to triggerfreeparents.com. I really hope you enjoy the show. Thanks for listening. Hey, everybody. It's Robin. Welcome back to Parenting Our Future. Okay. (laughs) If you don't watch us on YouTube, you need to go to YouTube and watch us because you got to see how good looking my guest is after literally spending the night in a tent on top of her school. I have Karen Jakubowski here as her kids call her Dr. J and she is incredible. You guys just wait until you hear all about her and her work because she is helping to empower kids at school, kids that are not natural learners that may be neurodiverse. And I know that I can relate to that. And I know so many of you who are listening can also relate to that too. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. J. She's a well-respected international influencer on helping kids lead healthier, happier lives with a doctorate in educational leadership and nearly 20 years experience in education as a teacher, assistant principal and principal, she's highly regarded as an educational game changer. Oh, I love it. We talk about this all the time, Karen. We talk about it all the time that we need to change the game when it, and game, I, I use air quotes for that, but for education. Okay, wait, there's more. There's more. She is an empowerment coach. She provides a framework for parents who feel hopeless when their child is experiencing challenging problems at school or home to experience the happy life they always dreamed of having. Having through use through utilizing her revolutionary problem solving approach. Okay, I'm going to stop talking. Welcome, Dr. J. Hi, Robin. It's so good to see you. I'm excited to be here. I follow you. I love your work, and it is Aww. really truly an honor. I am um, really privileged to be here speaking with you today, and your audience. Oh well, thank you so much. Okay, so why did you sleep on the roof of the school? So uh, my PTA presidents like to come up with something to have the kids work towards. And um, oh. we, uh, our goal is to get the most PTA memberships in the state. So a couple of years ago, the goal was if we raise, increase our members that we've ever had before, Dr. J will kiss a cow. And they <laughs> reached and superseded that number. We got a state award from the state PTA and I kissed the cow at the local farm that backs up to our school. Yes, I can't even believe I did that. And then I got duct taped to a wall one year and I can't shave my head. And I was racking my brain, like, what else can I do? And I wanted to do something that I actually like doing, not just do something because it's crazy, but I would yeah. hate it. And finally, I mean, it took me so long to come up with this, but I reflect on the fact that my husband and I love going camping. And I was like, I'm going to 
like sleep on the roof in a tent. Like, why not? I do that out of nature. What's the, what's the difference? And they, nobody could believe it. A, they could believe I would stay the whole night. My vice president of the PTA was like, I don't endorse this. Like, you do not have to do this. And I'm like, I actually want to do this. Like, I'm okay doing it. So it was last night, the local news showed up. We had ice cream for the kids. They said good night to me out front. I did a Aww. live Zoom read aloud on the um, roof uh, talking about this book called the Super, Your Superpower is Kindness. Like, Aww. it was just awesome and the kids just couldn't believe it it was amazing so it was fun Okay, so I would like to invite the audience uh, in uh, to to send us uh, comments on ideas that you can do uh, for next year. Because now you've got to you've got to you've got to outdo. I actually have an idea that I'm going to share I with need, you. I do need report. some help. Somebody I've was got like, a great what idea. are you going to do it next? And I'm like, I don't know. I think I'm going to ask the kids for ideas because they always have the best ideas. They always have the best idea. Of course, you have a but problem. Yes. Get kids to solve it. Right. Tell, they, they tell, me, no. what, tell me what your idea is. Okay. So we I'm writing it this. down when, when yeah. I, so when I, when I worked in marketing for McDonald's, we would take, uh, and we are the, the charity for, for McDonald's is, um, Ronald McDonald house charities. It used to be called RMCC, which was, uh, Ronald McDonald children's charities. Anyway. So what we did is we took the top executives and we put them in jail and they had to raise a certain amount of money. So you could do a certain amount of PTA memberships. Um, and when they get to that point, then they're out of jail. So you can actually sit in a little jail cell, which you can literally rent from like a prop store or like a you know party store. Not every party right. store has a jail, but anyway, maybe the police are involved. Like how fun would that be, right? They yeah. can put you in the back of a police car, whatever it is. And so free me, we, we called it free me for our MCC. And uh, oh. that of course doesn't work exactly for you, but um, I'm sure you could find a fun way to do that, but you don't get out until you have those PTA memberships that you're trying to. To, uh, trying to get. What do you think? I love that. I love okay, that. great. Okay. Yeah, and if anybody you. else has ideas, let us know. You can yes, find us please. on social media. You'll, you'll see when we tag this, you'll find me on Instagram. You'll find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, everywhere. And of course, all those links are always in the show notes to, to find Dr. J and, uh, and all this stuff. So, okay. Like let's dive into this topic because Look, I do have a neurodiverse child and, um, you know, he, he's kicked my butt in many different ways. And he's the greatest gift that I have without a shadow of a doubt, because he has made me, you know, want to be a better person, want to be a better mom, because I was in a place where I didn't know what to do with him. And I, you know, I was one of those people who really loved my career was, you know, doing well in the job that I had. And I felt powerless at home and that was really hard. And I, there's not one teacher I haven't cried in front of up to this day, you know, because you feel so helpless. And oftentimes the teachers are looking at you and saying, well, what are you going to do about it? And I, I, I don't know. What are you going to do about it? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So where, I guess what I'm trying to say is first off, I know what it feels like. I know a lot of listeners know what it feels like. And I think that it's hard to know where to start. So what do you tell, like, where do we start when well, we're faced with this? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me, let me walk everybody back to the point where I learned this process from. So about 12 years ago, um, Dr. Stuart Ablon came to the state of Delaware, six districts got together and sent teams to go listen to him for the day. And I was fortunate to have been brought in with the district that I was working with because I was a child study team facilitator. So in two schools, I would sit down and talk about the problems kids were having who didn't qualify for an IEP because they got right. their plans who didn't qualify for a five before because they have their accommodations plan. But okay, kids struggling with all different things. And who's helping them? Well, Those are the kids that fall through the cracks. Those are the kids. So I would, you know, knock up against, you know, difficulty of figuring out what we can do to support these kids. And, um, and then actually I'll back up to when I was a teacher, I had some kids who couldn't just sit and do the pencil paper activities of school. Mm -hmm. I say they couldn't do school, but they were creative and imaginative and yeah. they could probably create the next thing that is just going to be something that revolutionizes something in our society. And, and in the back of my head, I was like, we need to create technical schools for elementary kids because they're so hands-on but yet you sit them in a chair for eight hours a day, you make them do what we've always done. And it just isn't cut out for everybody. 
and there shouldn't be something wrong with that. So that's my yeah. There my shouldn't side. be something wrong with that. Absolutely. Oh, I have kids with behaviors, and I I had a kid run into the coat closet one day. We're going out to recess. Like, what do you think they all want to go out? To recess? But why is he hiding in the coat closet? Why 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 did he shut down when we started working? And I couldn't get him to work. So I faced frustrating moments as a teacher um, that I felt like I could never get to the bottom of why my kids sometimes did the things they did. And when this Dr. Stuart Avalon, who who followed the work of Ross Green, some of you might know his book. Oh, Ross, Ross School, Green, yeah. It's yeah. Ross Child. That's the, where this collaborative process comes from. And so it's, it's certain questions you ask. It mm-hmm. is certain tone of voice you use. And there's steps to the process. And I, when I heard it, I was like, it just synced with how I believe we should treat kids Mm -hmm. when they're having difficult moments. And so it took time to practice a new process like it is for anything, but it was incredible because we, I would then get to the point with kids for them to help me understand why they weren't bringing their backpack to school in middle school, why they weren't doing any of the homework. And sometimes you look at face value, what they're doing in that moment. But there's always, like exactly. Claudia Gold says, there's always a story behind every behavior. And this process gets to the root of why they're doing what they're doing. And like you and I said a minute on the pre-call was sometimes where we just go with, you know better. Why did you do that? I didn't teach you that. And we just rush to these, these phrases we end up using. But what, what if you actually got to the root of helping understand why your kid did what they were doing? And then either it's a problem to be solved or a skill to be taught. And then you move from there. And I've just seen it do 180 for kids in my school who were like the worst behaviors in the school to the point where we ended up turning them into leaders um, to give, you know, greet the tours when they came in and they they were using their skills because they were probably the mayor of the school and they just got themselves in trouble with the way they talked. And we flipped it around for good. And and then they were in the office giving these, um, you know, introductions to our tours. And the people in the office who worked there were like, usually that kid's in here because they're bad and here he is like incredible and they, they saw a different side of the kid and that I love. Hmm. You know, I, I couldn't love it more because really you and I are totally aligned in the way we see this, that behavior is communication. And so often that behavior isn't met with curiosity or compassion because the fact of the matter is a child who's in turmoil acts that way, but unless, and until we get to what's really driving that behavior, like how come let's really find out what's going on. And instead they get sent to the principal's office instead, which if it's your school, yay, you know, I'm happy they get sent to you, to you. Yeah. but so here's the question that I have, because look, I I've faced this many, many times year after year after year. And it's really hard. Uh, It's been very hard on me. It's been very hard on my child and it's been very hard on the teachers, right? You know, somebody said to me one time and I, and I, and I really, really believe it. And that is, you know, teachers are good students, were good students. So it's, and, and I, and I'm happy to, to be challenged on it because I, I'd, I'd love to, you know, I'd love to get your feedback on it. So the, the, the people who become teachers usually were good students, right? And so, yeah, is it not then hard for them to really be able to relate and really put themselves in the shoes of a child who's struggling? Like, what's the disconnect? Why, why do I hear this so often that, you know, a child's teacher doesn't understand them. And I love teachers. So I don't want it to sound like there's any disrespect. They work so, so hard. I love them. And when, when I'm faced with a teacher who is struggling with my own child and I'm struggling with my own child, it's just, it's hard. And I look to them for answers sometimes. So what is the disconnect there? So I think that's a really good point you bring up that most, most possibly, I like to give that caveat. Yeah. Teachers were really good students. Yeah. And maybe that's what makes me a little bit more unique with adapting to this philosophy because I wasn't such a great student. Oh, but okay. Somehow I made it through. Somehow you're here. <laughs> and I'm here. So there's hope for your kid. <laughs> I mean, I, they're all, I felt like all the other kids in my class were smarter than me. I actually grew up thinking I wasn't very smart, but actually I was one of the few 
in my class growing up who went to college, got my master's, got my doctor. So, and I was not a great kid in the sense that I lied, I stole, I cheated, all for really good reasons, like in elementary school. But uh, I, I I got that you know, at home. My parents totally changed around that I realized quick that is not the way to act. But it might be because I actually kind of felt like I was a bad kid because I did things mm-hmm. that weren't, weren't, I like to say, expected expected versus unexpected I say to a kid like that was unexpected what you did it's a little oh bit, I like that a little bit makes a little bit more sense of them than why are you misbehaving well what is misbehaving I don't even know what that means or says mm-hmm. what it looks like but unexpected oh that's a little bit like uh okay we know what's expected um usually we're teaching them that expectation and so I don't know the fact that you just said teachers were probably generally good it really I think there's a lot to that because you're right it is hard for teachers and I work with teachers and I've done this process for 12 years now and I still have teachers who look at me like are you rewarding them and I literally have to say it's an intervention because I chose as an assistant principal to have lunch with every kid in the school who had the most behavior referral write-ups why because I needed to connect there you go there's the connection before correction I needed to connect with them so that when I had to tell them something they listened to me and we built that trust but if you don't build that between them and you're just no 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 and you shouldn't you shouldn't you shouldn't the kid's gonna go away and a we know actually research shows that they don't learn from those mistakes they learn when you have the connection and you're calm and they're calm and their amygdala isn't freaked out and like Mm -hmm. not able to take in the learning because really ultimately we want them to learn from this mistake or unexpected behavior but how too often we're taking the punitive approach which shuts them down kills their self-esteem then they think they're bad kid and i don't believe that has determined the trajectory of who your kid is for the rest of their life their bad behavior does not have to determine who they are the rest of life, but how often do you see it uh, killing their self-esteem and then they can't pull themselves out and then they lack confidence and and then you, you as a mom feel helpless and you're like, what's happening to my kid? I don't know if that answered your question. But uh, uh, so uh, it here. answered it and, so a, and a million here. other questions that I had. It was so good. I'm like trying to feverishly write down everything that you said and what I want to say. So Okay, so first and foremost, what I think everybody needs to understand and every teacher needs to understand is that this has a ripple effect throughout their lives, right? If your child thinks that they are not smart, which you just said you felt you were not smart, and what do you mean by that, right? I mean, like, what does it mean to be not smart? But here's the thing, that is the record that plays in your head. And when we have a belief about ourselves, true or untrue, our brain goes in search of proving it to be true for us, right? This is the confirmation bias, right? It creates a neural pathway that every time you start to feel like, oh, I don't know the answer, or I'm confused, or I feel lost, or whatever, boom, I go to, I'm not smart, right? That's the neural pathway that we go to. So it makes, what we need to understand is that it has a ripple effect. And if they feel bad and are being sent to the principal's office, their teacher doesn't understand them. They're, they're told to, you know, they're told they're not good enough. What do you think it's going to be like for them three, four, five, 10 years down the road when they're in high school, right? What if they don't finish high school because they've been told all along that they're not good enough, that they're not smart enough? This is serious and it changes the trajectory of their lives. What if instead we said <clears throat> to our kids, and, and I will say, I do tell this to my kids, that school is not a measure of your worth. This is just the place you go. It's like the greens fees to life. Like you just, you know, we just have to kind of play along because it's the system right now. But I can tell you that it doesn't, it, it, it's going to be okay. You know, and, and, I, and I want to share one thing with you really quickly. And that is like my son, my oldest just got his first job. And so we're in the car the other night and I, I picked him up and we're driving him home. And he said, you know what, mom, I know a lot of, stuff about a lot of different things. And it's cool because I'm able to talk to people about lots of different things and it makes me feel like I'm smart. And I said, you know what, bud? Well, first of all, you are so smart, so smart, even though passing a class is hard for him. And I said, this is why we wanted you to get a job so bad so that we can unleash you to the world and you can see your gifts. You can see how wonderful you are because up until this point, really all you've had is school to validate or unvalidate your worth. 
even though we're at home saying, no, 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 you're worth it. You're worth it. You're, you know, all of this. Right. So, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that we've got to be really careful, the messages that they're getting and taking in. And we also have to make sure that they know that this isn't the end all be all. This is not a measure of who they are as a human and does not dictate how valuable their life is. Yeah. And that's why I like what Dr. Michelle Borba, she's written 27 books. She's been on Dr. Phil's show. All of, She travels internationally. Her latest book called Thrivers, Seven Teachable Skills of What You Can Teach Your Kid that no matter if they face trauma or they have faced it or haven't faced it, they end up thriving. And that's what we want. We want our kids to thrive. I mean, pre-pandemic, we want yeah. our kids to thrive. And now they all need additional support to help them thrive through this, these traumatic times. And, and one piece that she shares, we did a book study with parents and I, I had her on my podcast, absolutely love her and her work. She, she encourages us to find your kids' interests, find yeah. what they're interested in and foster it. If I don't even care about stamp collecting, and if you think that is like the most ridiculous thing in the world, just put it aside and go after what your kid's interested in. Put them in a bunch of activities and let them decide what they want to continue. Don't let them continue with things that you want them to, because sometimes too often we turn them into who we want them to be, and they need to find what their passion is. And it might be a little bit unexpected and surprising for us, but the more you can get them involved in that, that's where they find, like you said, those additional mm. outlets of like, I love this and now I know this mm. and now I feel better. And I, um, that, that I think that can help when I agree, it isn't that only academics, but they're holding a large percent of their world for let's say 12 years or 13 years of their life is so academic school focused. Right. Right. And I think we have to be able to meet our child where they are, not where we feel that they should be, because maybe you are a great student. And so there's also the parent piece where we can feel really triggered and we lead with fear instead of honoring who our child is, right? Like how, how have you had lots of, ex- you must have had lots of experiences with parents who are really stressed out and, and what, how do you handle that with them? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I like to be that support for them. Yeah. I, it's funny when I was a teacher, I never really thought I was such a good like teacher of the curriculum. I'm actually more of like a cheerleader, a supporter, mm-hmm. an encourager. Like I always found ways to show that kid who they could be that might not be who they see themselves today. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like that with parents. So when parents I have to call and share what their kid did, um, I actually share with them like your kid isn't a robot. And as hard as it is, and we take it so personally that our kid did something wrong, actually they're gonna learn from this and it's okay. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, we, we, we raise our kids, we teach them and, and it does feel, you know, helpless and feel like something's wrong with you because they did X, Y, and Z. But, but I, I just encourage parents, like, it's okay. Like, just let it go. Let them learn. This is part of their growing and learning because they're a human and they're going to, they're going to go through these and, and, and they're going to come out the other side. It's going to be okay. Um, and, and I just really love sharing with them so that I can be that encourager, right? Like you were saying, they feel so helpless. They feel so alone. And I guess the reason why I got into this work is because I don't want you to feel alone. I, I don't want you to feel bad about yourself. And, and that's our like go-to, like you said, it's that negative bias. We just kind of like spiral Absolutely. down and out and it doesn't have to be that way. And there's, there are, there are certain things you can say. There are certain things you can ask in situations that I've learned over the years and I've done it. And I feel like if I've done it, you could learn it too. And, and we could turn it around. So it is a positive experience and an out of something that could be the most difficult situation with your kid in that challenging moment. So what are some of those things that you can say and do? So the first thing I work with parents, which parents listening, if this is the one thing you start this week, this month, this summer, it's just stop talking when your kid is upset. Like parent, just, just take a deep breath. Don't engage with the firing back of the first thing that's popping out of your head because you're frustrated you're upset you know your your emotions are up you're raging riling whatever you went from yeah. skills one to ten in ten seconds flat if we just close our mouths the bit take a deep take a deep breath and choose not to react in that moment like just challenge yourself with that that's really that's really hard to do it's so easy to say it's really hard to do but i assure you if you practice it like a kid when they they do something on a playground the teacher brings them in they just kicked and hit so and so. I don't do anything. And usually the kids snot and crying their eyes out because they just got called to the principal's office. And what do I do? I wait. I wait. 
and I, you know, let them sit here and I'm doing my work and I have them in my peripheral. And if you do that at home, I know it's not perfect in every situation in life, but you've got to let your kid calm down. Just decide not to talk to them until they're calm and like to say and control their body. Because you and I both know those conversations we have with them in those elevated emotional moments. And 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 is it is it anything that you were proud of? Uh, nine times out of ten, it's something I regretted. Like we had international students, we hosted international students for years, and I would take them to the private school nearby, and then I'd come to school, pick them up after. And their worst thing was that they couldn't get in the car at seven o'clock when we need to leave, and I had a staff meeting. And don't you know? And here I, you could hear my voice, like I would just be like, I have, I woke you up, I remind you, I like, what else do you want me to do? And, and one morning I got in the car and just totally lashed out. And I was like, you always feel bad afterwards, but it, but it doesn't have to be that way. Right. <laughs> and as hard as it is, and, and we're going to mess up and don't beat yourself up when you notice it, but look, you're noticing it. And if you just recognize and start with that simple mm-hmm. step, I'm not going to engage with my child. I'm just going to wait and give them space, let them calm down. A kid is only going to calm down in their own time. You can't make a kid calm down any faster. So just let them be and just mute yourself. Stop talking. The more you talk, like they, they can't even engage with you because they can't are even so, hear you. I call it freak, in a freaked out mode. And there's all sides, which I can say more and more what that is. But yeah, I'll we'll start with that because I don't want to overwhelm you. Uh, well, it's not overwhelming. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So what you have to do, what, what I hear you saying <clears throat> is you have to push up against your own stuff too. You've got to push up against your own anxiety, your own urge to want to teach and correct uh, and lecture, right? You just need to stay quiet because if you don't, you may say something you can't take back. Your child also can't hear you. And I think, I think we think you're doing a little bit of the hand brain model too. Uh, right. Yeah. So the hand brain model is what I use all the time with my clients, with anybody who will listen, (laughs) people down the street, people who are just walking and doing their own thing. I'm like, Hey, do you know about this? No, just kidding. Sort of. Um, and, and that is just explaining where we are in our brains. And that's from Dr. Dan Siegel, who's really shown us a way to simplify the complex workings of the brain is to use your hand to, to, to show you the way the brain works. And the fact of the matter is when we are all emotion, we are living in our amygdala and we don't actually have access to our rational brain, which is our prefrontal cortex. So we will not make good decisions. We will not say wise, helpful things. We're going to make it worse. We're going to lead with judgment and fear most of the time. And we all just need to take a second, collect ourselves. And what's hard about that is what what you just said is, oh, you're not going to say anything right away. Oh, uh, you're just going to let your kid get away with that. Uh, right. And so that is this sort of generational way that we have parented our kids and it looks like maybe we're rewarding them. Maybe we are, maybe we're saying that behavior is okay, but that's not it at all. It's just knowing the way the brain works and and honoring that. Sorry. No, it's okay. No. And if you feel like you have to say something, because you're just practicing, not saying anything, because We've got to like take slow steps there. I get it. It, Right, right. It takes time. Like I said, for anything. Practice. You just just don't overnight, you know, do something. Then say to them and try in your most calm voice. I call it the elevator tone of voice. Like you're talking to someone on the elevator. You don't know. Hi, good morning. How are you? Mm -hmm. Just think of that tone of force yourself to do it. I know you don't feel it. You don't think it. You don't like it it goes against any, everything you're used to because you're retraining yourself. Like you were saying, Mm -hmm. say to your kid. I, I noticed you, you whatever it is, describe what they did. And I don't know what I'm going to do at the moment, but I'll talk to you in a few minutes. I'll talk to you later. We will wait till your dad gets home. If you need to say something, say something like that and then leave it. And I only, only talk about with the kid what they did wrong when they are calm and in control of their body. Could be 30 minutes. Sometimes I send them back to lunch and the teachers generally don't seem to like that because they think they should just, I don't know what they think they should do, but... It's not good, but I say in prison, you get to eat lunch. Like, I don't care what you did, but you get to go eat. You, you get to go eat lunch. Like, come on. But sometimes they need that escal- de-escalation time. And then when they're calm and control of their body, then there's the question that I say, I always state what they did, whether I heard it or I noticed it. Like, 
heard you, you know, hit Johnny on the playground, you know, you use this empathetic tone of voice without judgment, mm-hmm. without pointing down, looking down, making him feel like a peon. And, and you ask this magical question of what's up with that? And you just wait and you wait that impregnable pause that takes time to get used to because nobody likes that. And and we want to fill it with conversation, yes. right? With and, words. Okay. You you shouldn't do that. You know better. You We don't act like that at school. I don't care. Whatever it is, it's it's the, the, the real and the story that we're used to. But it just just try this and 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 um think your your child will look at you like you have two heads because nobody ever asks them about what really happened they're just used to us spewing at them whatever it is we think right so when you ask the first several times you do this it might be quite a few times when you do this they just actually might stare at you and not know what to say because they don't they've never they've never experienced you like this with them and then but over time they will come to realize that you will, you are wanting and willing to listen to them. And sometimes kids are scared to say what it really was because of, like you said, all the mind games they're telling them because they know they should have done it. So why would I admit to it? Because I know I should. Like, we don't know what they're all thinking in those, in those moments. Sometimes I have to add, um, there's no right or wrong answer because they think they oh, have I like to tell that. us what we want to hear, but we don't. We just want to know what happened. Like there was a kid who barreled into this first grade classroom teacher called me and he just ran the kids over like and now he's crying because he's in trouble now we're in the hallway and I yeah. just waited and I sat with him he's bawling and I just sat I didn't say anything I just sat and then finally he, he, he got it himself under control and I was like I heard you barreled in the classroom like what's up with that and of course they're like I don't know they shrug yeah. their shoulders I don't know and this is so fun I love this phrase you say to them I know you don't know but if you did know, what would you say? And you're probably like double negative on their mind and subconscious that it actually <laughs> triggers them to come out with the truth. Even Little mind know. trick. Yeah. 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 It's, it's, it's the coolest thing. So, and then if they shrug their shoulders again, I just say, there's no right or wrong answer. Like I heard you bailed into the classroom. You're using your elevator tone of voice. What's up with that? And you know what this kid said? Well, I couldn't believe it. He goes, my dad, he was, he was, I couldn't finish my breakfast this morning. And he was. I don't know if he said yelling, but whatever it was, it wasn't something so great, but I don't want to mess, mess up the story. But it wasn't even about barreling into the classroom. He was upset from something that happened like three hours because he had been at bear care, the poor school care, and, and they brought him, you know, yeah. and then you bring in that empathy piece and you've got to, you've got to meet them where they are with that empathetic approach with something like saying, oh man, that, that, that must have felt really, that sounds like that would that really feel good, huh? Like you've got to, you've got to meet them where you're at. Do so I think it's right how we felt? It, it, you got to put that part aside in your mind, and you've got to be empathetic, even if you thought it was right that his parents did whatever they did or whatever went on. You've got to jump into their shoes with them and let them. They got to feel that empathy from you for a second, and then you can. It will. It's either a problem to be solved or a skill to be taught. So you know maybe. He, he needed to eat something. Maybe, maybe he was still hungry. Like maybe, and that's why I say there's a story behind every behavior. And this process gets to the root. And imagine, parent, if you actually figured out what was bothering your child, because a lot of times what we see in the instant when they get in trouble is not always about just what you saw. And so it's so powerful, Robin. I I just can't speak to enough of this process. It is so powerful. And think about it, right? Think about it from, from your perspective. How many times have you been upset with something or somebody and taken it out on somebody else, right? And our kids don't have a fully grown brain. So let's just remember we do, and we still do it. So why are we so unwilling to give our kids the grace that they absolutely deserve the grace, the curiosity, the compassion, the empathy, right? Like putting yourself in, in a child's shoes and looking at the world to the way they must be seeing it with the giant of a dad that he has, who is angry out the door for work, whatever (laughs) it is. Yeah. Right. Whatever it is set in motion you know, this chain reaction where his child who doesn't know how to understand his emotions, can't deal with them or doesn't know how to articulate comes in and barrels to the class. Well, of course he did. Why wouldn't he do that? That makes absolutely perfect sense. 
So what I'd love to, so I love, oh, thank you for saying all of this. And what I'd love to do just to reiterate it, because I know um, I like to hear it more than once because, you know, that's just the way it is. So the first thing that you said is, okay, so there's a, there's an unexpected behavior. We like that instead of a, a disappointing behavior or a bad behavior. I too do not like good or bad. I like neutral. It, it just is. It just is. And so we deal with what is right. And so you just say, stop talking. Do yeah. your best to stop talking. If you feel like you have to say something, you can say, you know what, we're going to talk about this later. I'm not going to talk about it right now. Uh, and then, and then the next thing that you do is you ask and you say, Hey, what was up with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You just, you just state what they did. And then, and then even yeah. tone voice. And then right. Ask, okay. like, what's up with that? And like you, like you said at the beginning, curiosity, imagine yeah. putting curiosity back in. How about you try to get curious about what really happened? And, and it's like this weaving story that gets you places you might not end up a con. Yes. Yeah. So I, I mean, I, I love it. And so that means you also have to listen when you say what's up with that. You've got to be in a place where you can hear it and listen without judgment, I would say too. Right. Um, and then you, you, you do a little Jedi mind trick on them when they say, I don't know, you say, um, well, I know you don't know, but if you did know, what do you think it would be? Right. Yeah. And then they tell you, and, and from whatever there, they tell you, yeah, you just got to be open to a bit. Because how many yeah. times does a kid say something and we think to ourselves, that's not true? Well, that, that we like, like you said, we've got to let go of that judgment. Because then the second piece to this, uh, Dr. Avalon shares that it's either a problem to be solved that your kid needs to solve, or it's a skill they need to be taught. I and love we it. Assume so much with our kids, so much. Mm -hmm. So take your assumptions out and go with what Robin just said just go with what is and with what is, mm. then let's work from there. And so if it's a problem to be solved, like, um, um, I'm trying to think if, if that kid, you know, oh, well, maybe he, he needed to eat or something like that. Yeah. But sometimes I like to say, you know, what do you think we could do to solve this problem? Um, and you try to get them to come up with a solution. And Oh, so when I, when I was at one of the schools, the kid would, when the teacher was trying to sit and do a small reading group, the other kid, kids were working in the room and the one kid just got up and around and was don't noisy and couldn't sit down and couldn't, gosh, darn it. Like, just, I told you to do this. Like I'm working with the class, this group, like sit down, you know? Well, when I did this problem solving process with them, I said to the kid, I noticed that you're up and about and the teacher's trying to work and having a really hard time because you're talking to the kid and you're not doing your work. Like, what's up with that? And then when we got to the point where it was like, what do you think we could do to solve this problem? He said, I, I want to, maybe I could wear a head like earbuds. And you know what the teacher said? Well, that's not going to work. Well, that's not true. And I'm like, stop. You've got to leave all, if you're willing to work with it, as cockamamie ideas that kid came up with, go with it. As long as you're, I mean, there is a compromise you have to come to because if it's really something you're not okay with, you do have to come to something you're okay with too. But don't write off something that you never even tried. And if, and what if that kid tries it and then realizes it doesn't work and comes up with another solution and that one works? What are we teaching kids then? Collaborative problem or just problem solving skills in general. And our kids need that. That is a 21st century skill that kids don't have as much these days. So there's so much built into this that your child is walking away with so many skill builders that is yeah. always why I, I, I just, I, I really, I heart this process. <laughs> well, and, and, and here's the thing. When you open up the space for your child or the child to give their opinions and ideas. First of all, they love and desperately need as all humans do to be heard, right? That is a basic human need that we all absolutely have. They're more likely to follow through with an idea that they came up with, right? Exactly. So, the and yep. The fact that the grownups in their life who oftentimes tell them they're not good enough are like, yeah, that's a great idea. Whoa. Is that a confidence booster? Right. So they feel yes. good about themselves yes. too. So you've turned it into, I feel bad about myself to actually, now I feel good about myself. I have to come up with this. Right. Yes. Whoa. Yes. Which is why every educator in the world needs to learn this process. And now yeah. I love teaching parents because it hasn't always been embraced by educators and I'm tired of saying it and doing it and it not always being embraced that I'm going to find a parent who needs it. And now I've started to, and it's changing yeah. how they interact with their kids. And oh my gosh, I'm so excited. And every podcast I go on that I share this, the, the speaker is the host is like, this is amazing. And I'm like, yes, it is. 
Yes. Yes. It is amazing. It is amazing. I, I absolutely love it. Okay. So here's one last question that I have for you. Um, because I, I and I also want to talk about what you have for us in the parent toolbox, because it is so valuable. So first, I just want to say, um, or I want to ask you kind of going back to the first question that I asked, if you have a school that you have a teacher that doesn't honor your child. You have a principal that doesn't understand. What can you do? What would, you know, how do we navigate that? Because I think we all want Dr. J's in our school, but that's not the reality. So what do we do? How do we start? Where do we start? Um, well, you know, I'll just share with you what I tell parents when they come to me. Even this morning, a parent met with me about some issues that happened during the school year. And, and, um, and I really coach parents on what to say and how to speak to a teacher because, and it goes back to kind of this approach. You've got to use an even toned voice when you're talking. It can't have this, this aggressive or uh, blaming uh, mm -hmm. tone to it because that puts the teachers back against the wall. And they, in my experience, the majority of people or a percent, they just come right back at you and then then nothing is getting solved, right? So I, I really coach parents to talk to my teachers, actually, because the teachers appreciate hearing from the parent first before they hear from the principal. And I literally will tell the parent, like, this is how you're going to talk to the teacher. You're going to say, I heard, it's going to use the exact thing that I talk about. I heard my kid come home with this, or I noticed my kid was doing this. Can you help? And this is my magic question for teachers. Can you help me understand? Like, mm. just don't say what you think yet. Just go in like you said, Robin, be curious to the teacher. Can you help me understand? My kid came home feeling this way. My kid said that. My kid's paper. Can you help me understand where, where or how or why this happened? And just shut up. Let the teacher give you all their information. Like you said, there's two sides to every story. And too often we're dealing with the one thing we only see our way. But get their perspective. And it might not be your perspective, but then, do, but then take the opportunity to share with them how your child felt. Your child, mm -hmm. and keep that even tone of voice i'm telling you the minute you get that ounce of i'm upset at you or i'm gonna pound, pounce on you or i can't believe you did, like they're gonna feel it and then it just it just never goes everybody puts their walls up and so that's 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 been my i don't know mm -hmm. that that's how i operate and i have a very unique population here at my school and uh, with the parents that a lot of them are executive business owners and they just want the best for their child with this and they they you know they come in like demanding but you use this respectful approach you listen you you let them know oh my gosh i can see how that made them feel that you don't be don't um be okay to say i'm sorry oh I'm, you know i i kind of like really felt it that way or I, you know i told my teachers like it's okay to say you're sorry like now that you know what the parent and the child felt in that situation be willing to be like oh my gosh i'm so sorry they felt that way because a lot of times it's not what the teacher meant or on purpose. Mm -hmm. And we both really in the end want the same result. It's just helping us figure out how to get there and, and do it in a respectful way. And there is a way to do it. And and a lot of times when I coach parents to do this, they'll go back to the teacher and they'll share it or uh, rarely do I kind of hear from it again. Um, but, but that might help. I love that. Um, I really love that. I think, I think what happens is we do, we do come in mama bear, you know, stance and, uh, we want answers. And, and here's the thing. I think that you don't want to let it go too long. You want to just be able to be curious and open. And so what you're saying is, you know, can you help me understand? And, really try your best to leave your emotion out of it. And just, this is a fact finding mission, right? Like, let's just get the other side of it. And then, and then I think too, you want to create a win-win you like, how can we support each other? You know, that's one thing that, that year after year I've said to the teachers, even through my tears, like my husband and I, we are here to help any way that we can. We want to be a team with you you know, we know that our kid can be challenging sometimes. And we also know he's a great guy. Like he's a great kid. So let's work together because we are not the, you know, we, we are the kinds of parents that care about you as the teacher, but also ultimately our child. So, um, yeah. so I really like that sort of 
non-emotional approach, even though you're full of emotion, like yeah. just T- tell that to your girlfriend, call your girlfriend up and be like, I can't yeah. believe the teacher said this. I can't believe exactly. I love it. You, once you get it out of your system or my other girlfriend, she gets in the car and she just like says it like it is inside her car because she doesn't want to do it for her kids in the house. And yeah, whatever it is for you, like get it out of your system because it's there. It's legit. You have those feelings. I'm not saying discount the fact that you feel that way. Right. But I get you try this approach when you come in. And, and I always encourage staff and, and parents pick up the phone and talk on the phone or zoom mm. emails get so misconstrued. You can read mm. an email one way and put a tone of voice in another way and get completely like ticked off. And, and it's, it's the same words. So I, I, I 99% of the time pick up the phone because when the person hears my tone of voice or I can say, they, oh, match wow, it. I, they, yes. And they, I, you just you get so much further. I think a lot can be misconstrued. Yeah. Oh, I, that's, that's a really good tip. A really, really good tip. And I think we're so like, not used to picking up the phone. I'm almost, you know, like almost scared to use the phone, right? A parent the other day was like, you're calling me Yeah, because they just shoot emails back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. And And it can get really nasty. And couch what you're saying with like, I I tell a parent, like, start with, I appreciate everything you're doing for my kid. I know it's a difficult time. And then go into what your concern is and always finish it like you did. Like, like, well, I know I, it might be difficult, but we really want to be a team player. We want to do what's best for it. And, and again, I just want to thank, just say thank you for everything you're doing. Email the parent and CC the principal and just say thank you so much for everything you're doing. It goes so far. And they, yeah, and again, they are, they are like the rest of us teachers need to be heard. We need to be appreciated, validated too. And, you know, that's why I, I, I say, even when we have struggled, you know, I, I love teachers. They, they just, I mean, they are true heroes for what they've been through just the last two years Never mind, you know, what they do to dedicate, how dedicated they are to their jobs. I love them. They are amazing. And we've got to work together, right? Because it's, it's about our kids' future and, uh, we want to not look at our kids' future through the lens of fear, but we also need to know that this does have a ripple effect. And so we want to set our kids up for success, for success, whatever that means for healthy, thriving as best as we can. So I just want to thank you for this conversation. I think it's so valuable. And I I really love the problem solving, the collaborative problem solving approach that you mentioned. I love the open questions and, and thank you for that tip on how to talk to, to, to teachers or the principal talk to the teacher first before you get the principal involved. And, and, and I would say too, don't be afraid to go there. Right. I think oftentimes parents are afraid They're afraid you're going to take it out on my kid. And it is our job. We've got to advocate for our kids too. So, so with all of that said, um, you do have a family happiness journal and you've got an excerpt for us in the parent toolbox. So you can go to, to parent-toolbox.com and it is going to be there for you. You can download it and you can start to use it right away. Totally free to go to the parent toolbox. It is the companion site to this podcast. And it is important to me and to my guests that we leave you with something that will really help you in your parenting. It's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to give you actionable tools and resources that you need to help you with everyday problems, because we want you to be happier and enjoy your kids. We want your kids to be happy and thrive in this complicated world. So uh, do you want to say anything about the, the, the family happiness journal and what you have for us? Yeah. So that's so cool. You know, it just gives you a moment each month to write down what, what your child did that was beautiful or loving or Mm -hmm. kind that month. And then if you, you collect that over a year and at the end of the year, some parents keep it and give it to their kid uh, for like uh, winter, Christmas, we celebrate Hanukkah, whatever it is at the end of the year. And it's just a beautiful snapshot of all the good and positive that happened amidst, like you said, the challenges that just come with it. And there's a lot of people just really struggling right now. I follow several blogs on Facebook and my heart just, just really aches for families who are really struggling Mm. with kids and their intense behaviors. Um, and so that's just something that can be a positive in the midst of your challenges or struggles that, you know, it's not going to be forever and it might just be for a time. Um, and if you go to my website, which I'm sure Robin will put in the show notes, educational, sure educationalimpactacademy.com, 
you can put your email in and actually get a free video course of this very process that I walk you through step by step. So you can watch it again if you want to do it. See it for another minute. It's like a condensed version of the whole thing, but you'll get the gist of everything I shared here. And then if, if you want to learn more, there's a course I recorded for you because I held live pair courses, but I know everybody can't show up at a certain time, certain day on Zoom. So I've recorded for you if you're like a grab and go and you take it snippets. Um, and with that, it comes a free one, uh, one hour Q&A call that if you're available, you jump on. I'm there to support you. Like, what did you face this week? How did that work? What, what struggles did you meet with it? And just to encourage and inspire you in this journey mm. and this process. Oh, that is so wonderful. Thank you so much for all of that. Um, you, you really are a gift to so many parents. We need people like you and you just have such a lovely way about you. And, uh, and I just, I love everything that you said. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you for doing the work that you're doing again. Like I just, I, I know it's making a difference to so many kids. So, and so many parents, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Robin. Like I said, I follow you and all the work that you're doing. And it, again, it's it's just like a mirror. It's very inspiring. So thank you. I know sometimes we give and give and give and you don't always see or hear the responses back, but I, I just want to thank you because it, it was oh. awesome. And I just wish you all the Thank you. Thank you for listening to this edition of my podcast, Parenting Our Future. I'm parent coach Robin McMahon. And if you're enjoying this podcast, please share it with someone who you think might also need to hear this message. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like my work, I'd be grateful if you gave me a five-star rating. For those of you who like my content and want more, visit me at yellingcurebook.com to get your copy of my book and to find other resources to help you. Until next time, I am wishing you and your family peace and connection.